Prologue, Los Angeles, June 4, 1983 Hillcrest Country Club was as close to invisible as 142 acres on the south side of Beverly Hills could be. No sign, just a number on the stone entrance gates, 10,000 Pico Boulevard. Black Cadillac slipped inside one by one, the roar of the traffic falling away as they motored toward the clubhouse, a sprawling pile of wood and glass designed more for comfort than for style. Dense hedges of flowering oleander intensified the hush. Through the darkness lay the fairway, studded with pine and eucalyptus and redolent with memories. Ever since the Depression, this had been the preserve of Hollywood's elite. All the great moguls had belonged to Hillcrest, Louis B. Mayer and the Warner Brothers and Harry Cohn of Columbia and Adolf Zucker of Paramount. Most of the top comics belonged, George Burns, Danny Thomas, George Jessel, Milton Berle, the Marx Brothers. When Groucho said, I wouldn't want to belong to any club that would accept me as a member, he was referring to Hillcrest, but he joined anyway. Benny Siegel, the mobster who invented Vegas, was admitted, but Joseph P. Kennedy was turned down. Jews only. Danny Thomas was the exception. For the men who ran the William Morris Agency, Hillcrest was practically an extension of their offices. And this balmy June evening was their night, the night they'd chosen to celebrate their 85th anniversary in the talent trade. Eighty-five years. It was a milestone no other company in show business could boast of. In 1898, before television, before radio, before talkies, before Warner Brothers or Paramount or Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, almost before cinema itself, a young German-Jewish immigrant named William Morris had set himself up as a booking agent on 14th Street in New York City. Show business at the turn of the century meant vaudeville, and 14th Street, hard by the immigrant quarter of the Lower East Side, was vaudeville's home. From its beginnings in a second-floor walk-up across from Luchow's restaurant, the Germanic establishment where the impresarios held court, the Morris office had followed the business uptown to Times Square and across the continent to Hollywood, had followed it into pictures and radio and nightclubs and records and television, until now, in 1983, it represented more talent than any other firm in the world. Behind the mirrored facade of its sleekly modern headquarters in downtown Beverly Hills, a block removed from the glittering boutiques of Rodeo Drive, some 75 Morris agents represented 1,200 clients, maybe more, actors, directors, writers, singers, athletes, newscasters, politicians. Another 50 or so agents operated out of the upper floors of the MGM building in Midtown Manhattan. Two dozen more were stationed in satellite offices in Nashville and Europe. Some estimates put the total number of clients as high as 2,000, but no one outside the agency really knew. The figure was as closely guarded as the amount of commissions they brought in. Morris, being privately held, reported only to the tight circle of senior agents and executives who owned its stock. Yet no one doubted that it was the largest, richest, most powerful agency in the business. Wattage mattered more than numbers, of course, and Morris handled some of the brightest stars on screen. Jack Lemmon, named Best Actor at Cannes for his performance in Missing. Barbara Streisand, making her debut as director with Yentl. Clint Eastwood, whose Dirty Harry persona, Go Ahead, Make My Day, would soon be appropriated by the president. Richard Gere, the star of An Officer and a Gentleman, one of the top-grossing films of 1982. Mel Gibson, the road warrior's post-apocalyptic hunk who just solidified his star status with The Year of Living Dangerously. Barbara Walters, the first TV news personality to win a million-dollar contract. And so on. <laughs>